Good morning. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all here. Well, um, it's almost December. And the first week in December, traditionally in Soto Zen monasteries, there is celebration of Rohatsu. Rohatsu means in Japanese, the eighth day of the 12th month, December 8th. And uh, Rohatsu is a celebration of the Buddha's awakening. It's considered to be the time of year when that occurred. And uh, during the week leading up to the 8th of December, in Zen monasteries, oftentimes there is a prolonged, as it's called, sashin, a gathering of the mind, where people will sit pretty much from before dawn until after dusk every day for a week. And uh, this is a, a, I think next week we'll be in the midst of that. It'll be the 4th of December. So uh, that'll be the topic for next week. It's a time of reflection and renewal. It happens to overlap this year with Hanukkah, which I believe starts tomorrow. So during the week, that first week in December, it um, for, for most of us, it's a busy time of year. But you might consider adding an extra sitting session sometime during the, during the day. If you're accustomed to sitting once a day, you might sit a second time at a different time of day. And it's, it's interesting how the mind is different at different times of day. You'll notice that. Or if you're not accustomed to sitting every day, you might give it a try uh, for this week, this first week of December. It doesn't have to be long. It can be, it doesn't have to be 30 minutes. It can be 10 minutes. It can be 50 minutes. Um, the time is not so important as the intention. So um, today we'll continue talking about we're revisiting the Malakirti Sutra. And part of the reason for that is that um, I, I had occasion to reread it and I realized just how much I'd missed. Uh, and particularly this chapter we'll be talking about today. Um, I, I kind of glossed over it the first time. Um, a chapter called Beyond Comprehension, and it's talking about emancipation beyond comprehension and the bodhisattvas who dwell in emancipation beyond comprehension. And it starts off in kind of an odd way um, with uh, perhaps a little humor. Uh, at that time, Shariputra, observing that there were no seats in Vimalakirti's room, thought to himself, all these bodhisattvas and major disciples, where are they going to sit? As you recall, there were uh, somewhat like 32,000 bodhisattvas and about 
8,000 disciples um, all congregated in Vimalakirti's small room. Um, and Shariputra was concerned about where they would sit. The rich man Vimalakirti, knowing what was in Shariputra's mind, said to him, did you come here for the sake of the Dharma or are you just looking for a place to sit? I came here for the Dharma, not for a seat, said Shariputra. Ah, uh, Shariputra, said Vimalakirti, a seeker of the Dharma doesn't concern himself even about life or limb, much less about a seat. A seeker of the Dharma seeks nothing in the way of form, perception, conception, volition, or consciousness. He or she seeks nothing in the way of sense realms or sense media. He seeks nothing in the threefold world of desire, form, and formlessness. Ah, Shariputra, a seeker of the Dharma does not seek it through attachment to the Buddha, does not seek it through attachment to the Dharma, does not seek it through attachment to the Sangha. A seeker of the Dharma does not seek it through recognition of suffering, nor not seek it through renunciation of attachments, does not seek it through realization of how to end attachments or through the practice of the way. Why? Because the Dharma has nothing to do with idle theorizing. To declare that one must recognize suffering, renounce attachments, realize how to reach extinction and practice the way is mere idle theorizing, not seeking the Dharma. And of course you probably recognize that he's referring to the four noble truths here. And uh, Vimla Kirti goes on and on. And then he says, the Dharma is called unconditioned. If one tries to approach it through the conditioned, this is seeking the condition, not seeking the Dharma. Therefore, Shariputra, if one would be a seeker of the Dharma, one must not seek it in anything at all. So I, I think the rest of the chapter tries in a way to, to illustrate this point. And um, um, as, as is often the case, after a sort of shaming Shariputra about wanting to sit down, the Malakirti softens and, and uh, arranges seats for everyone. But um, as is his style, these are not just any seats. Uh, they're not just sort of camp chairs. Uh, he, he talks to Manjushri. Manjushri is the uh, follower of the Buddha who is um, thought to be um, the most enlightened, uh, if one can use that phrase, uh, if one can quantitate enlightenment. Um, and actually, um, uh, Maha, I'm sorry, I, I, I got confused there. I, I'm referring to Manjushri. Manjushri is the, um, the follower, uh, is the bodhisattva of wisdom. And uh, Manjushri is noted for traveling around for, to the various uh, Buddha lands and uh, gathering and dispersing wisdom. So uh, Vimala Kirti asks uh, Manjushri uh, where he can get the best chairs. And Manjushri says there's a, there's a Buddha land you know, far, far away, um, many worlds away where uh, they, they have the, 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 the finest um, lion thrones that everyone can sit on. Uh, so uh, Vimala Kirti, exercising his transcendental powers has uh, 32,000 lion seats brought to the room so that people can sit down. And these lion seats, as it turns out, are enormous. 
um, they're um, much, much, much larger than um, the room and the way we usually perceive it. They're 42 Yolandas, Yojanas rather, tall. And a Yojana is the um, distance that the royal army can march in a day. But all these enormous chairs are uh, somehow fit into the room without any problem. And the people uh, who um, are to sit on them somehow are made to accommodate these huge chairs and uh, sit comfortably. So, um, So Shariputra is impressed with all of this, and uh, Vimalakirti uh, tries to explain. And Vimalakirti says, Ah, Shariputra, the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas have an emancipation called beyond comprehension. When a Bodhisattva dwells in this emancipation, he can take something as tall and broad as Mount Sumeru and put it inside a mustard seed without enlarging one or shrinking the other. And Mount Sumeru, king of mountains, will still have its original shape. Moreover, the four heavenly kings and the gods of the heavens who live on Mount Sumeru will not even know or realize where they have gone to. Only those destined for enlightenment will be able to see that Sumeru has been put into a mustard seed. This is called dwelling in the doctrine of the emancipation beyond comprehension. And he goes on and on with examples such as this, uh, concluding with, and when the worlds of the 10 directions come to an end of the kalpa and everything is destroyed by fire, the bodhisattva with emancipation beyond comprehension can take all those fires and hold them in his belly and suffer no harm. So I, I think I think it might be helpful to reflect a bit on on um, <laughs> what what possibly might be going on here. The the Mahayana movement in Buddhism, which came uh, a couple hundred years after after the Buddha died, um, generated this enormous literature the Mahayana Sutras, of which the Vimalakirti Sutra is one. And they expressed a reaction to what they perceived in uh, the Buddhist tradition as it was evolving. They thought it was becoming too stultified, too rigid, too rule-based too cold, too hierarchical. And they were reacting to this and trying to bring some warm blood to it, to bring a beating heart to these teachings, which they thought had devolved since the Buddha's time. And these sutras were said to be the more mature or advanced teachings of the Buddha. Now, whether you're willing to accept that or not, I think is neither here nor there, but clearly the movement, the, what the Buddha had set in motion was changing as all things change. And the Mahayana movement was a demonstration of that. The 
sort of fantastical elements of these sutras, I think are to emphasize the boundless potential, the boundless potential that is unleashed when wisdom is infused with love. Not setting aside the valid wisdom incorporated in the various rules, precepts of which the, Bo the Buddha spoke. And, and I think it is credible that the initial teachings of the Buddha would tend to be more rigid and more rule-based. For instance, when the Buddha gave his first talk to Rahula, his son, his son, when he became of age, uh, joined the Buddha um, as a monk. And uh, the first lesson that the Buddha taught Rahula was very much rule-based. Basically, it was about don't tell lies, adhere to the truth at all times, never tell a lie. No, never. Always be truthful. And he emphasized this again and again in that little sutta. So, uh, And, and, and going on in the, in the chapter, um, Maha Kashyapa has been listening. And, and this is the um, uh, follower of the Buddha who I referred to earlier, who was said to be the most enlightened. Um, if you can speak in that way. He was listening and, and heard this discourse and, and was impressed. Um, with the power and potential of this emancipation beyond comprehension. And uh, was uh, speaking wistfully about how he could uh, somehow um, participate in this. So um, then Malakirti goes on towards the, the end of this chapter with um, a passage that uh, I sort of skimmed over the first time and, or at least didn't absorb fully. But I think it can be helpful. There's a little discussion between Vimalakirti and Mahakashyapa. And towards the end of that discussion, Vimalakirti says to Mahakashyapa, sir, sir, among those who play the part of devil kings in the countless worlds and the 10 directions, there are many who in fact are bodhisattvas dwelling in emancipation beyond comprehension. They employ their skill in expedient means to teach and assist living beings by appearing in the guise of devil kings. Or again, Kashapa, with regard to the immeasurable number of bodhisattvas in the 10 directions. Sometimes people come to them, um, sometimes people come to them begging for a hand or a foot or an ear or an ear, a nose, a head, 
an eye, marrow, or brains, blood, flesh, skin, bones, or their villages, towns, wives, and children, men and women, servants, elephants, horses, carriages, or for gold, lapis lazuli, seashell, agate, coral, amber, pearls, agate shell, clothing, food, or drink. Many of those who beg in this fashion are bodhisattvas who dwell in the emancipation beyond comprehension. They employ their skill in expedient means and go to the other, other bodhisattvas to test them and make sure they are firm in their resolve to give alms. How can they do this? Because the bodhisattvas who dwell in the emancipation beyond comprehension possess powers of authority and virtue that enable them to importune others and make them perform difficult feats. So I was just trying to imagine um, if we can look back on our lives and, and think about the devil kings that we've encountered at various times. And imagine that they are all bodhisattvas emancipated beyond comprehension, applying their skillful means to importune us for our own benefit. Changes one's perspective. And who knows? So uh, I think I'll stop there and uh, leave you with that. So what, what is this emancipation beyond comprehension that is being referred to? I gave you some of my thoughts about it, but um, <laughs> there's always much, much more here. And, and what about the, the devil kings <laughs> that have visited you in, during your life? Um, How does it how does it feel to regard them as bodhisattvas? So uh, we'll stop there and um, I break up into uh, groups for discussion. Um, I think we'll make two groups here. <clears throat>